Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first in a series of Ask Me Anything events put on by Earth Science Women's Network. Uh, ESWN's mission is to promote career development, build community, provide opportunities for informal mentoring, and support and facilitate professional collaborations. ESWN currently supports over 5,000 members across several plat platforms and from a broad array of earth science disciplines. At the end of the stream, we'll have the co-chair of ESWN's professional development committee, Mona Bell, and the president of Earth Science Women's Network, Meredith Hastings, provide more details on who we are and what we do. MJ and I are here today as moderators and organizers representing Earth Science Women's Network. MJ, who's currently behind the scenes making all this magic happen, is a PhD candidate at Colorado State in Fort Collins, Colorado, US, working in environmental and atmospheric chemistry. I'm Anna, I'm a water resources engineer working in ecosystem restoration in the Western US at a consulting firm called Flow West. The topic of today's AMA is allyship. And we'll be using Nicole Asong Nifoyinoyim Hara's definition of the term, which is when a person of privilege works in solidarity and partnership with a marginalized group of people to help take down the systems that challenge that group's basic rights, equal access, and ability to thrive in our society. Today, we are thrilled to have two excellent speakers on this topic, Aviwe Matiwane and Brittany Bloodheart. Aviwe is a lecturer at Rhodes University, research associate at the Albany Museum, and a science communicator. She's finishing her PhD. Her research interests are in paleobotany, ecology, student learning in higher education, and science education. She has received numerous awards and accolades for her master's and PhD work. Aviwe is an advocate for animal rights and also for black women's empowerment in STEM. Brittany has a PhD in social, social psychology and women's studies and is currently an assistant professor of psychology at Cal State San Bernardino. She researches barriers to women's advancement in STEM and increasing gender diversity and inclusion more generally. She has worked in the earth science community on programs to mentor and promote undergraduate women in the geosciences, prevent sexual harassment, harassment in academic field work, and uncover implicit biases in the evaluations of women's success in STEM. So welcome to both of you. And with that, we'll jump into the questions. So first question, how does allyship take you beyond advocacy? Or how does being an ally make you more than an advocate? Um, Aviwe, could you start with a response to this one? Oh, sure, I would. I'm sorry, there's a, a delay in my uh, speech. Uh, there's a network problems. There's so much wind here on the side. Uh, but I think the difference uh, also goes uh, with uh, intent. So, for example, with alienship, it is more of trying to stop uh, and end the discrimination of the, ma the marginalized. And uh, with advocacy, it's more of an amplifying. So you amplify what um, uh, the, 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 the problems that are faced. But at the same time, uh, moving towards being an ally uh, is more of uh, being able to listen to what uh, people have to say, educating yourself in, uh, you know, in, in certain issues and topics related to uh, marginalized groups. And also, I mean, I make an example of um, an advocate and an, and, an, and an ally. So this is actually a, a very, uh, you know, um, interesting topic because there are a lot of people, and even if you read online, a lot of people have differences about what they perceive to be an ally and what they perceive to be an advocate. And uh, what they say are uh, sort of like, there is, there, there's huge contention. But, uh, you know, personally, I would say, I would give an example of, you might have someone who is an advocate in a particular, you know, uh, idea 
in terms of, let's say, maybe uh, advocating for women's rights and uh, advocating for uh, empowerment of women in STEM. Uh, but uh, they're not necessarily an ally in the t in the sense that, because uh, for example, advocacy sometimes comes with funding. It comes with uh, by you amplifying and putting things out there. Uh, it sort of like comes up with benefits. Whereas uh, if you're an uh, ally to a particular person, uh, will you be able to uh, if things are if if you're amplifying and you're supporting and trying to stop and end what is going on? Uh, with ma with marginalized groups, would you be able to lose the funding that you are, you are having if uh, it doesn't go uh, with um, you know the ideals of uh, the packages that come with it? So um, so you do have people in your departments, for example, that would say I'm an advocate for women in STEM, but are not necessarily allies when it comes to you uh, you know asking or uh, for help or assistance with particular Oh, we'll just give her another minute. It's a little frozen for me. So, um, I Aviwe, your your audio is cutting out a little bit. So we'll we'll go to Brittany for a minute. Um, Brittany, do you want to okay. add add on to that at all? Um, sure. Well, first of all, thank you for having me. Uh, it's nice to to chat with all of you, even though I'm, I, you know, I'm curious to see who's actually out there. Um, yeah, I think you know a lot of what Avi was saying is is that you need to walk the walk, not just talk the talk, right? Um, that that being a true ally encompasses not just saying that you believe in or support. Um, particular issues or particular groups, but that you really, um, you have to take that step in engaging and, um, uh, you know, sometimes that's uncomfortable, sometimes it's awkward. Uh, and being being ready for that, being aware of that. Um, yeah, I think, you know, she, she made a lot of good points that I would agree with. It sounds like maybe you're back with us, Avi. I'm sorry. No worries. <laughs> That's what happens when, when you stay on a farm. So I'm on a farm and there's so much wind and it's cold, five degrees Celsius outside. So it's just, um, yeah. I'm well, sorry about that. No worries. That was a very, very minor interruption. Well, let's, let's go to the next question, which um, we had. So the question is, what are the traits of a good or effective ally? And I just want to add that we had a lot of interest in this topic from the people who registered for the workshop. People had a lot of comments about what does it mean to be truly helpful and authentic as allies? So um, Brittany, could you start with this one? Sure, you know, I think uh, you probably have a lot of interest because it's a, it's a big question, right? Um, and I think that there are, um, a lot of different ways to be a good ally, but I think, um, you know, in particular, one one thing that's um, important is to really listen to and respect the needs and the experiences of marginalized people in in STEM or in general, right? Um, that we we don't want to make assumptions about someone else's experiences or what's best for them. Um, what, what might work best for them. So I think, um, you know, really being able to like take a step back and listen and um, uh, uh, not assume that we know everything, right? Not assume that we always know what's best if it's not us being the ones experiencing that particular form of discrimination or whatever bias, what's, whatever's going on. Um, and it, I think another big one is uh, constantly reminding ourselves or, or recognizing our own privilege, um, depending on the space and who we are and in, in, in what context. Um, you know, uh, there's been more and more discussion of this, I think, um, on social media and, and more popularly, but um, privilege is often invisible, right? And so those of us who have privilege in different spaces need to do the work to recognize how we have that privilege and what it is um 
And if we do have privilege in a particular space that we have a responsibility to challenge that, right? Um, so uh, that's another another thing I think is really important. Um, maybe one of the last things that I, you know, just, just as a general kind of big picture piece, um, I think that, you know, one thing we know about how bias and discrimination and marginalization works is that it's often subtle and quiet and little pieces here and there, right? We don't, it's pretty uncommon to see, you know, very blatant outward big forms of discrimination, particularly in areas like academic STEM fields, right? Um, instead, it comes with little comments here and there or little, little subtle behaviors, right? So, um, uh, excuse me. <laughs> so I think, you know, one thing we have to think about is challenging those, those smaller things to pick, to be aware, to pick up on them. Um, and also to, to call them out, right? Sometimes it's difficult. It's not always easy to know, um, what was meant by a particular comment or if it was in a certain context, right? Um, but that doesn't change the impact that it might have had on a marginalized person. So thinking about the impact, not the intent of a behavior or something like that. Um, and, and being brave enough to, you know, to stand, to stand up and say something about that. Great, thank you. Aviwe, do you want to add anything about traits of an effective ally? Uh, sure. I mean, I agree with most of the things that uh, um, Brittany had to say. Uh, I think one of the key steps is uh, for one to actually be aware and acknowledge, uh, you know, they, I'd say their own biases and um, their own privilege their own uh, assumptions about particular, uh, you know, groups of people and to be willing to, uh, you know, to listen and educate yourself as well, like I keep saying, because I think what happens is a lot of marginalized groups always tend to get irritated or, uh, you know, um, don't seem like they want to assist because it seems like you are not willing to do the work to actually, uh, you know, help out. So um, never feel you bad if someone does not want to tell you what to do. The first step is for you to actually know what the struggles um, of people are actually going through. I mean, there's so much research and there's so much material How, how can I help you? You know, can you hear me? You cut out for a minute there. Um, you were saying that there's so much okay. research and material out there. Yes, there's so much research and material out there that people can actually, you know, uh, read for themselves, uh, try and understand, and then ask questions, you know, about uh, how they can help. Uh, certain individuals and how they can assist in different scenarios. So it's not only about trying to get the information from only the, the people that are impacted, but also to equip yourself to be able to, you know, to assist when uh, it's it's actually time for you to, you know, to help out. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, also another thing is to also uh, be able to um, allow to be corrected um, be um, be willing to accept correction because we don't know everything. You don't also know everything. So if you are going to be um, not willing to be corrected, then you won't be sort of like a good ally at the end because you will sort of get your ideas about what the person needs without actually asking what the, 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 the major issues or what uh the, the the people actually need that uh need your assistance and also it helps to amplify voices of the people that actually know 
what they're talking about or what they stand for if you are not uh you know well versed or know about the particular topic so mm -hmm. um i mean that's just adding on to some of the things that uh britney had met had mentioned earlier on so there's just um you know there's so many things that uh, you can do, but the first thing as well is to acknowledge, uh, learn from other people, be willing to uh, be corrected, and also respect other people's opinions because we all have biases and we all have assumptions that we've already made about certain groups. That's that's really yeah. helpful for me. The willingness to be corrected is a yeah, it's a good reminder. Yeah, um, if I could. If it's okay, if I could just add on for a second, I think this gets into, you know, maybe another question that was posed, but um, it, I think, you know, some people are scared to engage in allyship because they're afraid they're going to make a mistake, right? Um, I'm going to say the wrong thing. I'm going to do the wrong thing. I think uh, as long as you approach it with an open mind and an open heart, right, and that you're willing to listen um, and correct and change the things you do or say, you know, if somebody says, hey, that was offensive, you know, saying, wow, I'm so sorry, I didn't realize that, I'm gonna make sure I change my behavior next time, that's a huge step forward, right? And I think that that's all we can really expect from people. Um, so we're all gonna make mistakes, right? We don't know, um, we don't always know everything that you, these biases, as Avi said, were are embedded, right? They're they're in our society, they're in our language, in, in the the things that we do. And so we're gonna make mistakes sometimes. We're gonna just do something, follow something that we've learned without recognizing that it was perhaps problematic. Um, and just being open to the fact that, oh wow, that was problematic. I'm gonna make sure that I change that, right? I think that that's a big step um, toward being a, a great ally. Great, thank you both. Okay, our next question. How do you encourage faculty or colleagues to engage in allyship actions that are not just performative and actually help underserved colleagues? Um, Brittany, if you could start with this one. Yeah, I think um, this can be tricky, right? It's hard that you, um, these are people that you work with that might have different um, kind of levels of power in your in your workplace and things like that. Um, one thing we know from research is that although people don't like to confront others and people don't necessarily like to be confronted, um, it is a really effective tool. Mm. And there's ways that you can do it that are not overly harsh or harmful, right? That there's a way that you can say, hey, by the way, I know you didn't mean it like this, but I think that this, you know, this was harmful toward a person. Um, what can we do to change this, right? Or I noticed, I picked up on this. Um, I think it's important that we we don't do this anymore, right? This kind of thing. Um, so, um, you know, confrontation to some degree is, I think, can be a good thing. Um, I think leading by example is a huge piece too, right? Um, the more that we really, um, not just, uh, espouse our values, but really enact them, really live our values, um, can show other people that it's okay to do the same and other people will follow. Um, let's see, I don't know. Those are <laughs> those are my two main thoughts. That's great. Um, Avi, Avi, do you wanna add anything here? Uh, sure, I mean, one of the things is as well, you can watch your language. Uh, what you say um, around people and how they react to it, uh, towards it, you know, and uh, be willing to, um, you know, to to engage uh, in certain situations that make you uncomfortable. So uh, it's not necessarily about you being, uh, you know, comfortable in your own space, but being uncomfortable to make other people comfortable in that space, in, comfortable in that space as well. So um, also, I think, um, I mean, for example, uh, you might have a woman, uh, I mean, ideas, like for example, opinions and ideas in the works in the workspace that I might come up with. And I think, oh, we were working as a group. I came up with these points, but uh, for me, they will be clearly dismissed, you know? 
And then if Brittany comes up with the same idea that I have come up with, I mean, it amplifies the same things, you know, it is praised and championed. And um, I mean, it would be, I think, one of the ideal things, for example, for Brittany to say, hey, a viewer came with this, uh, you know, uh, this, this opinion or, um, you know, Anna came with this uh, with this opinion or a, a suggestion or and stuff, you know, so certain things like s small things that you can start doing. And also, for example, even small things like insults that are, you know, targeted at uh, particular groups in the workplace. I mean, those are the things that you can also, you know, stand up for and say, no, this is not acceptable. Uh, we don't do this. You know, um, you need to respect each other. So, um, I mean, it's, it's, it's more when it comes to team and more in a faculty, it has to do with respect a lot. And also with, um, you know, um, the whole thing of being able to support each other in whichever way as possible. And I know it becomes a difficult situation when the same person, I mean, the, the people that are might end up being the, the perpetrators are way up top. And, uh, you know, people always fear, like they, they certain people who fear, you know, about their jobs, their positions, their funding. Um, what if they do speak up around, around uh, certain things like that? But, um, you know, I think things, it, it, it becomes hard to navigate, but I think it's, 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 it's always, um, there's always room for improvement. And as long as you guys as a team or, you know, faculty are talking about these things and making sure that they are addressed, because one of the things is it's, it's okay to, um, you know, to say, we offer this, we don't do this, uh, you know, in policies, but, what are are you implementing your policies are you uh, you know to make sure that your workspace is inclusive and unifying because what happens is sometimes policy is not implemented it's there in policy but people still don't you know about what are the consequences that our uh, employees uh, face when they actually go beyond uh, what is um you know are sorry the electricity oh yes <laughs> Sorry. No worries. Uh, so there's just so much that i think as faculty and members of you know your workspace can do to support each other but i mean listening to each other and respecting each other is one of the key things that you can do to move, move forward great thank you um I think we, we talked about this a little bit, but, and you're just touching on this about, you know, listening to people and sort of developing a, a culture where you have um, a better understanding of the, the people you work with and, and their diverse backgrounds, hopefully. So um, we, we had some questions about uh, best practices or recommendations for um, navigating, discussing people's identities and sharing your identity without being socially clumsy or unprofessional or awkward. I think people are also uh, concerned about that. Um, Aviwe, do you want to start here with this one? Sorry, can you please repeat that? My, uh, you were lagging, and I can't see certain things on the on the screen. Yeah. Oh, sure. Um, so we're talking about discussing people's identities and sharing your identity without being invasive or socially clumsy or unprofessional. This is actually quite a. <laughs> I like this question, but at the same time, it's quite tricky mm -hmm. because uh, I think you can only you know, learn from your mistakes. You can only learn from, because uh, I mean, I, I, I can be good at one thing and know about one thing, but I can't necessarily uh, know about the rest or how uh, Anne might feel about uh, me talking about certain things or how Anne, uh, you know, or Brittany might feel, or I mean, how I might feel if Brittany were to address, uh, you know, certain things. So it's, it's, <laughs> It's quite tricky, but at the same time, I think one of the things that uh, you can do is to just, you know, I don't know, like when it comes to uh, 
this is actually quite a, a very tricky question to uh you know to answer because i mean it, it comes to the person and you make mistakes and you learn but at the same time uh, you should not be intrusive or invasive of other people's privacy and uh you know and um so if you're willing to share certain things i don't think it's uh it's you 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 should be forcing other people to to share as well or intrude in their personal space so um i mean th th that's that all has to do with respect as well but um i mean also asking i mean you can ask a person and uh, but at the same time the the way the question is also uh you know um us could be uh, a problem but um i mean it it, it 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 all has to to do with learning i don't know like i think britney would be more uh you know would have more to say about about this uh in terms of uh all this like the clum clumsiness and psychology behind all of this mm. yeah it does make me think um you know we know we know as psychologists that we have a strong need to categorize people, um, you know, just cognitively. And um, the very first thing that we perceive about someone is their gender, their race, and their age. Um, without even really doing a lot of mental work, it's just something that we pick up on about people, approximate age, right? Um, so I, I think behind this question is asking yourself, do you really need to know that information about somebody, right? Do I really need to know someone's gender identity? Um, probably not, right? Um, if they have a particular pronoun that they want to use, then um, respecting that if they tell you that, um, not making assumptions, I think is probably the first step, right? Um, asking yourself why why do I why do I feel like I need to know what this person's sexual orientation is? I don't, right? Um, unless it becomes somehow relevant in in a situation, right, where where something is brought up that is homophobic, right? And then mm -hmm. I might um, it might help me to know um, if this person was negatively impacted by by what was said or done, right? Um, but even then, that person, it's usually, you know, let let the person volunteer their information to you. And once they do that, then you listen and you remember it and you respect it. Um, but I think, you know, starting off with this idea of you, you don't have to know where someone is from necessarily, you don't have to know their racial background. But if it's a situation where it could be relevant, you can ask in a respectful way, hey, I'm sorry, did this affect you, right? Okay. Um, I'm sorry, my dog is barking. I, ho I hope you all can't hear it. Um, thanks both for your response of that one. That was a kind of a tough, tough question. Um, so the next question is um, how to avoid white saviorisms um, and while still supporting and uplifting underserved and mistreated communities. Um, Brittany, could you start with this one, please? Sure. Um, you know, I think I think we've talked about a lot of good ways to uh, to perhaps avoid this, right? To recognize that you have privilege in a particular situation. Um, in this case, if you're a white person, that you have white privilege, right? And um, and also and listening, right? And respecting what marginalized groups are experiencing and needing in a particular situation. Um, I, we had we had a little bit of this discussion uh, the other day, but um, you know one one thing that that came up um, last summer during a lot of the Black Lives Matter protests, we had um, a community of faculty at our university who identify as women of color who sent an email saying, um, you know that that we we identify this way, we identify that there are some major biases and issues in the university. We just kind of wanted to put out a, a statement of, um, you know, identity and, and, and um, uh, making, you know, making it clear that we plan to, to address this. Um, and I think, you know, as a white person, how do I support that cause, right? I, I, I certainly want to support that. 
um, but I want to be more than an advocate, right? I want to be more than the the person who um, writes back in the email, "Yay, good for you, you, you know, right?" <laughs> which which happened. Um, uh, so, but it's also hard because you don't want to put extra work on marginalized groups who are already under a lot of strain, right? Dealing with these types of issues. So there's there's sort of this delicate balance and I don't know that I have the perfect answer for it um, between doing as much work as you can to inform yourself, to understand the issues and what's going on, um, but then also asking for a bit of direction, right? That you don't get to decide um, what is the best path forward for another group of people if you're not in their shoes. So um, uh, respecting their needs, asking for what they need without, um, you know, demanding that they they do it for you, I guess. Thank you. Um, Aviwe, do you have anything to add for this one? I think uh, Brittany actually, you know, um, answered this question, uh, you know, perfectly. And um, I mean, you always uh, tend to have people who say they are allies and uh, they they don't listen. And all they do is to they, they assume that their way is the right way without even engaging uh, with you or, uh, or asking what it is that you need in terms of support. So, um, you know, this whole white, um, white saverism is sort of like a, a really, um, to blatantly put it, I would say it's sort of like a, a Oh, I think we're frozen again. <laughs> yeah. We'll just wait another minute to see if she comes back. I'm noticing that the uh, the captions are doing a good and then bad job of translating okay. things. The white, yeah, the white savior that they didn't get that. I, Yep. <laughs> I'm sorry, the are wind you? over here. The wind here is ridiculous and oh, it's no. really cold. So it's just like I, I keep going on and off and it is yeah. <laughs> it's, well, it's, we mostly yeah. we mostly got got there. You were you were about to say um white saviorism is blatantly and then it cut out. Oh, I was going to say that uh, white saviorism is sort of like blatantly racism because mm -hmm. I mean if you think about it. Uh, that's how uh, colonizers ended up colonizing Africa because they thought mm -hmm. that Africans were not, uh, you know, those savages and they were not uh, happy in these spaces um, that they were living in and they had to civilize them, uh, not necessarily knowing if, uh, you know, the black people in Africa were, uh, were happy to be and content with the way that things were. So um, I mean, it's it's it, it becomes really tricky when you want to be right without actually ask you know asking uh, whether people want um, your assistance because uh, I mean imposing yourself and your ideas and knowledge about things that are not necessarily um, you know uh, asked for you to do is um, not right at all. Thank you. Um, okay, so we're getting close to kind of switching topics here, but before we go there, I wanna just ask if there are any other traits of a good ally that we haven't talked about yet that you wanna mention here? Um, and if, if not, we can move on, but if, if there's anything we haven't that hasn't come up yet. One thing I was thinking about just this morning a little bit as we were getting ready to talk is that, you know, challenging uh, embedded systems is going to take some courage. It's going to take some bravery. And I think um, being prepared for that, you know, is important, right? Um, that, that there are going to be times when you feel like you're the only person shouting in the room. Um, there, there's going to be times where people are going to disagree with you or put you down as a as a way to you know kind of defend 
themselves and the way that they're used to doing things. Um, and so it can be uncomfortable. Um, I think as long as you are really solid in your values and your beliefs about this is the right thing to do, that that can, at least it's my experience, it can, it can help carry you through, but you know, occasionally it is going to be um, challenging, right? Um, and to kind of be ready for that, I think, you know, I remind myself that this might be hard for me, but it was harder for the people who I'm trying to to help and defend right now, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I, so for what that's worth, I think, um, you know, be brave. You can be brave, um, and it's going to take a little bit of courage sometimes. That's great. Thank you. Aviwe, anything you want to add about traits of an, a good or effective ally that we haven't touched on yet? I'm sorry, I'm laughing because my dogs are howling in the background and they just go <laughs> crazy. Maybe our um, dogs are actually having a conversation somehow. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, I think we've uh, we've talked uh, so much about so many things, you know, um, and so many in, in sort of like different topics. I mean, one of the things that I um, I think a lot of people might not understand is when people get angry in the workplace, in the workplace, particularly marginalized people. Uh, I mean, it's not always because I mean you find. Ten the tendency that uh, we always sometimes, you know, just keep quiet and we bottle things in. And then when we are actually, you know, have had enough, that's when you have an outburst. And then you get labeled uh, for that one out outburst of frustration that you actually, you know, uh, brought forward. But no one has has ever asked or um, ever, you know, because sometimes it's really hard as a person of uh, either color, I mean, color or, uh, you know, um, or underrepresented uh, people to, you know, to voice certain things in the workplace. And uh, it, it becomes a challenge when you're the only one that's there. And, um, you know, and what do you do? Because um, because sometimes people don't see anything wrong because that's the the, the environment and um, you know the what they used to in that in, in in those spheres. And then I will come and I will say, no, this is not right. This is, oh, you get labeled a troublemaker. You get labeled like a whole lot of things, a list of things because you're standing up for yourself and you are literally showing people what they're doing wrong and they're not accepting it. And, uh, you know, because things were never this way before you, uh, you know, you came around because you're making people feel uncomfortable uh, about doing a certain jokes, uh, you know, at tea time, uh, you know, addressing uh, certain comments that people are saying. Um, I mean, you try your best to, uh, to assist uh, people in so many ways in the workplace or just your friends but uh, sometimes you um, you run at being uh, you might you end up being labeled uh, certain things because of you voicing and standing up for yourself. Um, like I said, it re it really becomes hard when you are the only person of uh, you know a marginalized group in a certain environment. So I think that's where you actually do need allies. You know to stop certain microaggressions, to stop racist jokes, to stop, uh, you know, uh, insults uh, regarding uh, uh, gender, you know. So it's, um, so it's really important to look within yourselves as, uh, you know, as people in a place of privilege to say, okay, I need to ask, uh, was this fine? How did, uh, sometimes people do not necessarily have to say something uh, to, I mean, to, to say, okay, I didn't like that, but you see it in their body language. You see it in how they react uh, when certain jokes are made or when certain statements are said in, in certain companies. So um, I think those are the things that you also need to be aware of. And when you do see a change in those or, or those reactions is to actually go and say, uh, was there something that was said that you didn't like? And how can I... Ex a help address this in the future and make people aware 
uh, that it makes you uncomfortable in this works in this workplace or in this environment. Thank you. Yes, I'm hearing a, a lot of we need to be really listening in our professional and academic settings and being brave and along with that bravery comes a willingness to be wrong or to be corrected by someone. Um, so our next, we're gonna talk about kind of institutional systems and barriers now. So the next question is, what are some of the social and institutional systems that pose barriers? Sorry, I lost my, my spot. Um, the post barriers to creating equity in the earth sciences. Uh, Viwe, if you could start with this one. Okay, so I I would say um, you know. Oh, have you way your audio is cutting out a little? So, so maybe we'll. Have so you said, uh, what are some of the so a barrier to creating? Okay. Yes, I think your your audio is back. Barriers to creating equity in the earth okay. science. Mm -hmm. Uh. Aviwe, I think we'll switch to Brittany and then have have you jump you in. It's it's coming in and out right now. Okay. So we'll we'll switch to Brittany for a minute and then come back to you if that's okay. Um. Sure. So. Uh, so you know, I'm not an earth okay. scientist, I'm a psychologist, but I have worked with quite a number of you um, in different capacities and you know, specifically um, as it applies to the earth sciences, one thing that um, I've chatted with some of some of your fellow earth scientists about um, are things like um, access to research opportunities. So um, this isn't necessarily related to race, but neither is this, this conversation, but you know, things like assumptions about ability so depending on where you're doing research, right? Um, those of you who go out in the field and act, actually have to carry equipment and go to remote kinds of locations and things like that, um, you know, it's, it's sort of easy to assume that only able-bodied people can do those things, right? Um, only people who can uh, backpack up a mountain with 50 pounds of equipment or, um, who can take uh, the time um, away from childcare needs in order to sail on a boat for six months, right? Or whatever, whatever it is that the research requires. Um, I think we need to challenge those assumptions about um, only those people who are able to do those kinds of extreme things should get those research opportunities. I think we need to think about um, well, no, there, you know, there are other ways that we could um, buy equipment or rent a vehicle or, you know, pay other, pay certain people to carry the equipment up the mountain or whatever that is, right? Um, or how do we make sure that we are um, providing childcare options for, um, for people who, who need that to go out in the field so that everyone has equal access to those types of opportunities? I think, um, something I've, that's something I've learned about working with earth scientists. Um, so that's one kind of embedded institutional barrier um, or systemic barrier that I think can be challenged. We just often don't think about the fact that, um, you know, should we be doing this research project? Not unless we can make it equally accessible for everybody. Um, I just, just as some other examples, I know um, if you think about um, how people get internships, how people get, um, you know, uh, a postdoc position or something like that out of grad school. A lot of that is related to letters of recommendation written by um, people that someone else from the, the hiring department knows, right? Um, that can become problematic when people of the same 
gender, race, abilities, et cetera, are working together. Therefore, I know this person, therefore I'm going to hire their student, right? Mm -hmm. um, there's also some bias in knowing what kind of institution someone got their undergraduate or graduate degree in, right? Um, and But if we think about the fact that there are systemic um, uh, uh, reasons why people might come from a more prestigious or less prestigious institution, um, that we don't want to make the assumption that their abilities are tied to that, right? That they might have been funneled into that particular um, institution or educational setting because of um, these unfair, you know, uh, group identities, right? Our race, our gender, our socioeconomic status, et cetera our nationality. Mm -hmm. So, so and, and it's tricky, right? It's complicated, but, but um, thinking about when we're, um, when we're evaluating new candidates for a particular position, um, not basing it on some of those kind of uh, typical background characteristics that we might assume make someone smarter or more capable um to try to to try to um account for some of the bias that's already built into where that person might be coming from or who they've worked with thank you <clears throat> Aviwe, any thoughts from you on barriers to equity in the earth sciences i think uh particularly from you know uh a point of view coming from you know South Africa and you know just Africa as a whole I think the one thing is particularly in earth science there's uh, barriers in race there's barriers in gender there's barriers in ethnicity um, and also there's barriers in the sense of where you come from uh, in uh, in terms of the global south and the globe and the global north you know and um, uh, I mean there's just so much that I can actually, you know, talk about. Just this whole question is, I mean, we can go on for an hour with it. That you have a lot of gatekeepers and it seems like uh, new voices are not uh, heard or are not listened to and you are not respected, particularly if you come from a certain, uh, you know, socio-economic group, or if you're, you know, working on a particular project. If it doesn't have teeth or anything fancy, then it's not, uh, you know, worth, uh, you know, researching uh, per se, you know. And also, um, there's this whole thing of if you are, you know, a black uh, and come from a disadvantaged background, uh, you just use there to tick a box of inequity so you can get the funding and say, uh, okay, fine, we've, uh, you know, we do have a black person or a person of color in our, you know, in our, in, in our research group. So obviously we will get the funding. Uh, failing to support the person, failing to actually equip the person with the knowledge that they need to actually succeed. I mean, uh, there's just so many things that are happening in earth sciences that seem to, uh, you know, to, we are aware of, but I mean, uh, even talking about it uh, becomes a problem. And um, I mean, ugh, it's it, it's actually a frustrating question just to, you know, to even, to even discuss because it, it affects me uh, personally as well. And um, I mean, it, 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 not just because I'm black, but I mean, I'm, imagine I'm a woman I am a black and, uh, you know, I also come from, uh, you know, a, a disadvantaged uh, background and I can tell you stories about the things that I have been through in, uh, in earth sciences. And then people wonder why women or people from marginalized groups don't stay in the field, you know, mm -hmm. or, or, you know, venture away from the field or they decide okay i'm not going to stick with academics any I mean, academia anymore i'm going to leave um it's 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 a whole lot you know um a whole lot i have been through uh in earth sciences and a lot of people i mean if people don't know what my story is 
uh, they'll ask, but I mean, when people actually, I mean, when people realize what my story is or, or, or what I've been through uh, in this field, then they say, why did you stay? You know, it's because I have passion and I want to know, uh, you know, impact, uh, you know, um, uh, young minds. And I want to, uh, you know, pass on the knowledge that I've, I, uh, I've received. And I feel like I have, you know, um, you know, a good platform to do this. And, uh, but it's, it's, it becomes taxing emotionally and psychology and psychologically. And I mean, it's, you, you, you get to, uh, to a point where you want to give up and you keep pushing yourself because you're passion, you're passionate about the research that you're doing. And there's so many people who have left the field and, uh, particularly in paleo sciences and uh, people don't understand why they, I mean, it, it's, it, it hurts when all these, I understand the need for workshops. I understand the need for these, but I mean, when the workshops are targeted for the mo marginalized and not the perpetrators, then what's the point of having all these workshops or, uh, you know, or all these talks, because it's always the same people that go to these workshops and it doesn't actually help those, it doesn't help them. I mean, it's, you can't have a workshop about racism and you only have the marginalized there uh you know with uh with the whole thing about racism who are we going to i mean who are you going to impact uh who how are you going to create change when the people who are the perpetrators of uh of all of this are uh, are not even you know uh in these workshops or participating in um in in making sure that um you know all of these things are overcome in earth sciences it's it's um it's a really sensitive topic for me and um but yeah thank you so much for sharing of your way and yeah i'm i'm glad you're in the earth sciences and and talking with us about this today um so we're getting a little short on time so i'm having to pick between our remaining questions. Um, and let's, how, how about just kind of more quickly, any tools or strategies that you've found to be helpful in overcoming these barriers and realizing that it's sort of an ongoing challenge too? Um, uh, for example, uh, okay, I will, uh, it's hard to uh, change things when people are not willing to change. Mm -hmm. So I have the best support group in my friends. And, uh, you know, I have the best allies. I have the best, uh, you know, people, my close knit friends who are, we, we all, uh, you know, uh, people who you can talk to and know that, uh, you know, things will be done. I, uh, I mean, when we talk about certain things and we decide as a group that we'll stand together and not do certain things that are, you know, expected of us that do not uh, inter in, in, you know, um, you know, enrich us in any way, we don't do it. You know, we support each other and we, we talk about it. And I mean, um, another thing is, uh, I mean, I, I don't think I would have stayed in earth science if I didn't have the friends that I had. I have um, uh, because I mean, from Norma to Kim to Slindo to, you know, uh, they're they just so many people who have helped me, you know, be the, the strong person that I am today. Because I mean, so many of us have wanted to quit and, uh, you know, and it's just the support that we have had and we've created amongst each other that has uh, assisted. And then obviously, you know, uh, you do have some people who are also willing to help, but, um, you know, but but don't know how to help. Uh, so only when they actually see or they notice that, hey, there's something that uh, that's affecting a, a certain group of people, then they're willing to help. But I've, 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 I've gotten strength from my friends and the group of people that I have around me. That's great. Thank you. Brittany. Um. I would, um, let's see. I mean, 
there's, <clears throat> excuse me, there's a lot of things I could say. I, one thing, um, I'm a big believer in like a top-down approach, um, meaning that uh, you put a rule and a policy in place and the behaviors will follow and then eventually the attitudes will follow. Uh, I think, you know, we often assume you have to change people's attitude to change their behavior. But um, social psychologists are really big on the fact that when you change people's behavior over time, that can change their attitudes to be in line with that behavior. Mm -hmm. And so even if you don't get buy-in from everyone initially, um, having some rules and some policies in place that uh, help create equity, that help um, you know break down some of these barriers, over time people come to accept and then believe in them as, as important things to do. Um, so, you know, that to the degree that you can make some institutional changes, right, get some policies in place, I think, uh, you know, as, as Avi was saying, you know, that, that checkbox on your, um, your NSF proposal that I have a person of color working on my team, right? Um, obviously, that's not enough in and of itself. But I do think it's, it's a step forward in people understanding, okay, I need a diverse team, right? Um, and it doesn't stop there necessarily, but I do think that those kinds of requirements can start to help, right? As as they become more normalized, as people get used to them, um, then we can take another step forward and, and have other things that we require too. So um, again, it's not it's it's not the only thing. It's not a one and done. But um, I do think you know just just making changes, you don't have to have everyone's buy-in at first, um, can kind of start to shift our awareness and our, our environmental, our acceptance of, of these things. Okay. Thank you. All right. Can I, I just add the, oh, just, please. One, just one thing. Uh, yeah. I was going to say, particularly this is for, you know, postgrad students and stuff, particularly in earth sciences. I think it, it would be wise for you to actually to research the lab that you actually want to go into. Uh, you know, make, make a thorough uh, investigation about who the people are, how are people treated, you know, and uh, also the supervisor that you have, I mean, the, the, the supervisor that you want, I would say, you know, uh, are, are, they, are, are, the type, are they the type of person that will, you know, stand up for you and, uh, you know, assist you in certain things? So, you know, I've been, you know, I, I've been blessed to have like a really wonderful supervisor who has helped me through the years. And um, so that also helps in terms of finding a good, uh, you know, community to help you navigate your way uh, through all these, uh, you know, all these struggles and things that you would actually um, you'd face in uh, in your certain uh, faculty or your workspace or wherever you are. Thank you. Okay, so um, just in conclusion, we wanted to ask you both if there's anything else you wanted to say to the to the audience on this topic. Sorry, my dog's of course going crazy right now. Um, <laughs> Um, whether it's something that came up in the discussion or words of encouragement, whatever. Um, um, Brittany, do you want to start? Um, <laughs> I, I go, I don't know. I feel like I've exhausted <laughs> um, several points unless there's other kind of specific questions. Um, I'd love to know who all is in the audience and if there's, you know, questions that have come up as we've been talking. I don't know if that's a possibility. Um, okay. I, sorry. Um, not that I'm I'm seeing yet. Um, but let me let me take a look. What Aviwe? Do you have any other thoughts that you wanted to add? Um, what can I say? Uh, well, firstly, thank you for uh, you know listening to us uh, talk about uh, this topic. And also, I mean, this topic is a broad topic, and I think we could have like follow up topics like we had said, uh, you know, previously. And in terms of discussing uh, and focusing more 
on uh, you know the affected uh, uh, topics that like uh, that we can discuss. And um, you know, I we are. I mean, Brittany and I are always happy to to engage with you in the social media, to engage with you, you know, professionally via email. If you want to have, if you have questions or you'd like to hear, you know, uh, pers our perceptions about certain things. But uh, I mean, I think I've exhausted most of the things that we wanted to say. I don't want to repeat um, everything over and over again. But I mean, if you want to ask anything further or you want to know my story or you want to know, you know, just like anything, just um, contact us. Great, thank you so much. Um, okay, well, with that, thank you to everyone for participating in this first Earth Science Women's Network Ask Me Anything event. And thanks especially to our brilliant speakers. It's so wonderful to have this conversation with you both and hope this is the start of more conversations like this. Um, thank you. And just to let everyone know, we have our speaker's contact info here on the slide, as well as for MJ and myself. And um, also there's information here about donating to Earth Science Women's Network if you're in a position to. And so please feel free to, to reach out to us. Um, we wanna hear your feedback, your thoughts, more questions, this will help us in designing future events um, for Earth Science Women's Network. Um, and there's also a survey that will be coming out in the next few days for the folks that registered for the event. And then lastly, please consider joining Earth Science Women's Network. It's free and a great resource for women in science. Thank you again for, for participating in this event. And now we're gonna switch over to a message from Mona Bell and Meredith Hastings. Thank you. Greetings everyone. My name is Mona Bell and I serve as the co-chair for Earth Science Women Network's Professional Development Committee. Joining us today is the president of ESWN, Dr. Meredith Hastings. Meredith, welcome. Thank you, Mona. I have three questions for you, Meredith. First of all, please tell us more about ESWN, how it got started and how it got to be where it is today. So uh, Tracy Holloway, who's now a professor at University of Wisconsin-Madison, and I were in graduate school together at Princeton University. And we attended um, some of our first scientific meetings and conferences together. And we really found that together, um, we felt much more emboldened and empowered to um, attend lots of activities and, and go to lots of different scientific um, sessions and social things where the, the audience or the, the group were really dominated by, by male scientists. Um, but as a team, we really um, enjoyed interacting in those spaces and felt more confident. And so as we went through different meetings and conferences, uh, we would meet other women. Um, and we tend to be attracted to other women that were around because there were very few of us. Um, and uh, we started, you know, talking to these women and keeping in touch um, outside um, of the meetings and conferences and really were feeling, uh, uh, we're really uh, enjoying interacting with each other and connecting um, on, you know, both research and our, our personal lives and, and different professional and personal goals we had. And one of the things that really struck us is that we recognized that we were just didn't have very many women role models around. Um, there were very few uh, women scientists or, or women faculty um, in our different um, spaces. And so um, we started keeping in touch on a regular basis and we, um, you know, basically said, if you meet other women who you think would enjoy having lunch with us, add them to the list. And, um, and the list really just grew from there by word of mouth and um, ultimately became um, a Yahoo group for a while. And then, um, and then a listserv that was supported by the National Center for Atmospheric Research uh, for a really long time. And the group just grew incredibly, um, really exponentially every year and, you could just feel the, the passion and excitement that women had for their careers and their personal lives, but they also wanted 
community and they wanted a space where they could feel safe and, the, and supported um, and be able to like kind of let their hair down and, and be open to, to talking about, you know, both their personal and professional goals and their struggles and the obstacles they were facing and, and, and what, you know, barriers they might encounter and how to overcome them. And so um, the community really started as an email list that, that just was interacting and supporting each other and sharing resources. Um, and then uh, when I started as a faculty member at Brown University, I wrote a grant to the National Science Foundation to support ESWN and its activities. And that's that helped us to really uh, become much more solidified and more formal um, as an organization and support uh, some professional development uh, skills trainings, which really were born out of us discussing things that we felt we needed um, to be successful um, in our careers and um, and you know and and sharing that amongst the lift lift serve and getting input from the whole community. So um, so coming off of the NSF grant um, in 2013 we decided that the best way to stay sustainable would be to become a nonprofit organization to allow us to be a bit more nimble in, in raising um, money. And we were also recognizing that all of this work that we were doing was really volunteer time um, and, and creating some separation of that from our, um, you know, our career paths at our um, universities or institutions or scientific organizations. And so here we are today as a, as a nonprofit organization, and, um, and really our goals are to, to diversify uh, the earth sciences and support initiatives that really make the geosciences more diverse and more inclusive for, for everyone. And most of our focus for the last decade or so has really been on gender diversity, um, but we are also supporting all kinds of partnerships and initiatives to really grow and share this nurturing, you know, powerful community um, across the board with people of all kinds of different backgrounds. What an inspiring story that is, Meredith. Uh, I came to the United States back in 2006 for my PhD and ESWN has been a part of my life ever since. So thank you for sharing that. Um, I'm curious about your role as a president. What does a president do? So today as president of the nonprofit, of course, this is not my day job, right? My day job is I'm a professor at Brown University. Um, but as president of the nonprofit, um, I take fiduciary responsibility for the nonprofit to make sure that it's sustainable and that we're following the guidelines, you know, federally um, in terms of raising money and, and spending money. Um, and our again, our goals are really to support initiatives that um, will make people in our community successful and, and feel supported. And so we plan a lot of different activities. So as president, um, you know, my role has really evolved over the many years that I've been a part of this organization. Um, and as a nonprofit, again, we have all you know, these rules that we have to follow, but we also have an associate board of directors who um, help to lead um, a variety of activities. So, you know, even yourself as, as heading up the professional development community and helping to plan and organize um, activities that contribute to the professional development of our community um, in a way that really enhances, uh, you know, the value people find in their careers and, and how they can kind of bring their best selves forward um, and, and be in spaces where they really feel confident, comfortable, and empowered to succeed. That's quite amazing. It's almost like having a second job, isn't it? Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> but we truly appreciate the distributed leadership of ESWN too. It has been an honor and a pleasure to serve on the leadership board of uh, Earth Science Women Network. ESWN to me, Meredith, has been a sounding board ever since. Um, what does it mean to you? It really, I guess, means community. Um, community and support and the 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 level of trust and nurturing um, and support and sharing that goes on amongst um, ESWN and anyone who encounters our group and becomes a part of it. Um, you know, today ESWN membership really means you support our mission. Um, and that goes beyond, um, you know, gender that goes beyond, um, you know, any particular association that people have. So our membership is open to anyone who wants to support our careers. And we still support a variety of activities that that are really uh, aimed at making helping women be successful. We're still very underrepresented, especially in leadership roles in the sciences. Um, but absolutely, you know, it's very clear uh, that there is a variety of systemic issues that have not only, um, you know, detracted from women's careers um, in the sciences, but but especially um, people of color. Um, and so we're, we're really interested in, in helping to support those. And so I just find the, the, the passion, the support and the trust that that community brings together really inspiring. 
Um, and ESWN to me has always been about the, the members, the people who make up um, the, the organization and who are involved and creating initiatives their own and, and getting out there and, and you know, being successful and, and being an incredible example for the rest of the community. So, so that's really what ESWN means to me. It's really never been about uh, myself or, or you know, the people who have taken leader on leadership roles in the organization. It's really always been about uh, you know, some, supporting the community together at the same time as supporting our own careers. That is just fabulous, supporting the community together as we grow ourselves. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today, Meredith. If you would like to learn more about Earth Science Women Network, please visit eswnonline.org. Thank you. Thank you, Mona.